Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting for um, Christina. She's having some trouble connecting. So just give us two minutes and, and we'll get started. Okay. Thank you. Alrighty, wonderful. Hi, good morning, Christina. Hi. Sorry, I was a little late. I was trying to get my kid on online school. Apologies. <laughs> no worries. Um, Yvonne, can we get started?
Yes, good morning, and welcome to Miami DDA's Urbanism Committee virtual meeting. My name is Yvonne De La Vega, Board Secretary for the Miami DDA, and I will be serving as the moderator along with Ivory Boston and Elvira Manon from our Miami DDA team. Some important information before we begin. Uh, board and committee members are reminded not to communicate with other board members via chat, message, or phone, as, it's, as it is a violation of the Florida Sunshine Law. All conversation is to happen within this meeting that is being recorded. We encourage board and committee members and all participants to use the chat feature for any questions and or comments you may have during the discussion. Board and committee members, Miami DDA Executive Director, City of Miami Deputy Attorney, and our presenters will be on video with the microphones open. Please note that if you mute yourself, you may need to request that the meeting host reopen the microphone via, via chat. You um, may not be able to unmute yourself. Members of the public will be able to view this digital meeting fully, but microphone and webcam features will be disabled unless necessary. This meeting will be live streamed on Miami DDA's Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube platforms. Members of the public may pre-record their questions or comments by dialing 305-379-6570, or you may send your questions and comments via email to at de la Vega, D-E-L-A, V as in Victor, E-G-A, at miamidda.com. Public comments received via email or phone message will be read during the meeting and will become part of the public record. There will be a public comment section after each discussion item where questions received via chat, email, or phone message will be read and appropriate parties will have the opportunity to respond. The chat button is located at the bottom center of the Zoom screen. Closed captioning has also been made available for this meeting. To activate closed captioning, please press the CC button located at the bottom of the Zoom screen to the right of the share screen and record button. Members of the public who are dialing in will not be able to use the chat feature, but you may also email or record your comments at 305-379-6570. Please remember your phone will be muted for the duration of the meeting. And with that, Urbanism Committee Chairwoman Marta Viciedo, the floor is yours so that we can begin with roll call and and then the public comments received. Great. Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. Um, I want to just give a quick thank you to Yvonne and Ivory and Elvira and everybody at the DDA staff and, of course, uh, Christina. Um, managing these meetings is not an easy feat, and I think, uh, you know, they've done an amazing job. This is now, um, I believe, the third Zoom meeting uh, the DDA has had, and so I just want to give a shout out to thank you uh, and thank you for, for shifting so quickly. Um, so if we could go very quickly through roll call, Marta Viciedo, board member. Gary Ressler, board member. Lane Higgins, board member. Barnaby Min, city attorney's office. Spencer, I think I heard you in there. I saw you in there somewhere. Are you online? Yes. Hey, yeah. He's on. Okay. Spencer and Franklin Hi, also. Nice to see you. Good morning. I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Franklin Sermons, board members on. Great. And Christina Crespi, executive director, Miami DDA. Um, Marta, before we start, and we have a list of uh, everyone who's on, um, so we can either read the list uh, and, and maybe easier to take a roll call so everybody's not talking over each other, or uh, we could just, you know, write them down. So, Barbie, okay, I don't we know if we write. actually need to recite everybody who's on here. Um, and then we also have one question that was received via email, if you want to. Okay. Uh, Yes, please. Okay. And this is from uh, Joy Don Prevor. Um, she says, just before this craziness, I joined you at the last DDA urbanism meeting and shared my co concern regarding the development. That sorry, sorry. Um, I have to leave the room for this discussion. Just, um, I have a feeling I know where it's going. Um, it's a quasi judicial matter for the county. And so I don't know, will someone just call me when you're done with this and I'm gonna mute this conversation. I'm not allowed to hear any information that isn't held in a um, public forum where the folks presenting the information are sworn in because it's gonna be coming before the zoning um, board at the county. So someone text me when you're ready for me to come back, please. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, 
Okay, I joined you at the last DDA urbanism meeting and shared my concern regarding the development that would use Southside Park for staging, parking, and eventually retail concessions. At the time, Commissioner Reyes assured me that there had been a mistake and the issue would be revisited. I also stress that this is an issue that I believe the DDA needs to take on and ensure the residents' needs are met. In the interim, it appears that the agreement was executed by the city manager without commission approval or proper public notice. Even when the February 24th resolution was advertised, the title did not convey the significant portions of the agreement transferring public land to private developer and allowing use closure of the park. Would you please update me on what has transpired? Uh, is that it? Okay. Good morning. And Joy, thank you for your comments. Um, unfortunately, what you know is what we know. Um, the, the item has been problematic. And as you know, when we had this conversation um, at the last meeting when you presented, uh, we expected a different outcome, but it moved through a, a process that um, we just simply were not aware and it caught us as, uh, by surprise. Now, understanding that this, the location that we're talking about in, in particular is not technically within the DDA boundary, but it serves um, a number of residents uh, that, that are DDA residents and they live within the, the boundary, it is of utmost concern to us. And so I will, let me let, me let Christina chime in in case she has any other updates that would help. Um, but we are, we do find it uh, a problem. And so we would like to, uh, you know, perhaps find a way to put some sort of resolution forward to help bring this back in th through more appropriate channels. So let me let me let Christina chime in real quick, and we'll revisit this in a second. Hey, how is everybody doing? Good morning. Um, thank you, Marta. Same kind of feedback. I haven't gotten um, much um, answers out of the city based on Joy's email yesterday on on the park. I don't know, Barnaby, if you want to mm -hmm. uh, chime in as well. Uh, it seems to be a real estate, um, an asset management issue. Um, and so absolutely, if the committee wants to propose a resolution to address it, um, it's appropriate. I've talked to the chair about that. They're fine with it. Um, it's just dealing with the COVID-19 crisis things like this, for instance, have kind of um, taken a back burner, but I do think it's an important issue that we need to, um, you know, raise and address. And so if that's the will of the committee to, to offer a resolution to do so, um, I'm supportive of that. Have we seen the project as a whole and understood it? No, no I apparently, think... oh, sorry. Uh, just no, go ahead. apparently go ahead. even the documents that were submitted um, uh, when it went, so maybe I should let Christina, because like it, it, it's so convoluted. Um, even the documents that were submitted originally for the uh, the commission meeting had the wrong attachments. Um, so there's just been, and so it was originally when it even um, was this, was put on the agenda, it, it wasn't even the right information with it. So um, there's just been a lot of problems with this, this particular item. So I think what I can do is, uh, is make a motion, um, uh, not make it, but just uh, put it out there, like that we could do a resolution um, that basically asks the city to re to re review this item, to bring it back to the city and 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 have a review. Um, so let's let's uh, it, can we have some discussion around that? Madam Chairman, Hi, Chairman. this is Spencer. Real quick, sorry. Um, I, I just feel like I, I don't know anything about this project that hasn't been pre presented to us by staff. Um, I, I just, I, I think it, if we're going to take a position on this, we should have our staff uh, make a presentation to us, fill us in. And so we know exactly what it is we're voting on. And I don't know, given the situation where there's a lot of misinformation coming around, I, I, I just, I don't think I can vote on a resolution right now without having this prepared by our staff presented to us so I can make a decision based on the merits. Understood. Christina, is the, how do you feel about um, so, so the information not, that's missing? Yeah, so the project is not technically in our district, it's in the park, but it is a park that services our residents. 
And yes, Spencer, you're right. I mean, um, we haven't even gotten a presentation. Like Martha mentioned, the backup in the item when it went to the city, I guess now, what, two to three months ago. And Elena, if you're on the call, please feel free to chime in. Um, had the wrong backup. Uh, apparently it's been signed, I think. I mean, Barnaby, I, I don't even know if that's accurate or not. Um, Yes, but, Madam Chair, woman. I was gonna. I was gonna add that the agreement has been executed. So, you know, assuming you want to put this off to a future meeting, I can get a copy of the agreement to forward to all the committee members. Um, the other potential suggestion, and it's obviously up to the committee, is we could arrange for the city to come and make a presentation to the committee. Um, we could also reach out to the developer, who I believe is represented by Melissa Topinus, um, to have them come and make a presentation as well. And, and I also and, uh, think. We I mean, we don't need to discuss this now. I agree with Spencer. I, you know, I, I've heard a lot about the project. I've, uh, I've been reading, actually the developer has reached out to me to share their presentation to give, give me a better understanding of it. It's, you know, because of COVID, which is, I assume, the reason everything has sort of fallen off the, through, through the cracks. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to have that meeting. Um, I, I do want to say, I want to put a pin in the fact that we need to start having a discussion about being behind the eight ball on all these issues again, whether it's this or the kiosks, the fact that things are going and passing city commission without the DDA being even advised about it is concerning. Okay, so um, in terms of moving forward, um, what I'm hearing is we will, uh, we would like a presentation as soon as possible. Now, what does that do in terms of timing, Christina, for the concerns that Joy is expressing? If we wait another month to do a presentation or could we have the presentation sooner? Um, Barnaby, can you help? Because I honestly have no idea where that project is to even offer that two cents, but um, we could always schedule a meeting sooner, depending on that. Uh, but go, go ahead. No, I'm, not, I'm not sure I really have an answer. Like I said, the agreement's already been executed. Um, so there are, are obligations and responsibilities that all the parties already have to start complying with. Um, you know, I, I don't know if they've started construction. I don't know what, they're, what they are in their, their process as far as financing or any, you know, any of that kind of uh, stuff as far as getting the project along, but I know that the agreement has been executed. So this is Spencer. Uh, I guess, you know, as a baseline level, I think we should get a copy of that agreement and, and take a look at it. I mean, it, it's, it's just, I just think it's kind of convoluted that it's, I mean, the, the project's like not in our district. I realize it services people in our district, but, um, I, you know, and I'm fine yeah. taking a position on something outside our district, but not without like the full information and certainly not without understanding what this agreement says and the context within which the agreement was executed. So, so we'll, yeah, get, and we'll I can, get a copy of that and we can circulate it and schedule a presentation, um, you know, based on uh, everybody's schedules and the schedule of this project. Yeah, and I, and I can appreciate that, absolutely, Spencer. Um, but Joy, actually, we, in, in previous meetings, we have had, uh, we, as a, as a DDA, as the Urbanism Committee, this is not the first time this has come up. Um, and we have, because this project, the issue continues moving forward in what you're calling a convoluted way, which is exactly what it, what's happened. We have continuously taken a position, um, not an official position by resolution, but we have uh, continuously expressed our concern about this project and this issue. Um, at the last meeting, Joy is right. Um, the, the, the chair of the DDA did um, say that this is something that he would handle and unfortunately or you know he would look into he would ensure that was reviewed um, and unfortunately that didn't happen um, and I think while while it is not within the DDA boundaries um, because within the DDA boundaries and particularly in the Brickell area there are such limited public spaces park space this is a high concern um, for the DDA and that has been expressed multiple times over like with this particular project has been expressed multiple times over several meetings and what I don't want is for um, this to continue happening in the way that it's happened because I don't think I can't I, I it's not something I can support um, and just moving forward the way it has um, and the project that you know it's, it's, if you read the, if you look it up in the news you'll see that there, it, it, is, it is troubled from many angles um, so if, with that, Christina, if we can schedule a 
briefing um, as soon as possible, if it can happen before the next urbanism committee, so another month doesn't go out, I think that would sure. be um, that would be helpful. Yeah, Any other? I, and I think um, since it's going, it sounds like to the county for approval. We it, that makes me believe that we have a little bit of time here. So just wanted to mention that. I would also add just for transparency, Madam Chairwoman, it's my understanding that there's actually a pending lawsuit between the current developer and the previous developer yes. for the same project. So that may potentially hold up everything as well. Yes, yes, that's, a, that's what I was trying to allude to. <laughs> but yes, they're, 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 yeah. Um, but thank you, Barnaby. And, um, and with that, if there aren't any other comments, um, can we call Commissioner Higgins back onto the meeting and, and move forward? I'll go ahead and do that um, Thank while you. you move the agenda forward. I, I just okay, sent her wonderful. a text. Thank you. All right, so the next thing that we wanted to discuss, which is a hot topic um, on, our, on our full DBA board meeting um, on Friday, is sort of a group of items um, that together represent some mobility uh, interests that we have in the DDA. So I'm gonna turn over the floor to Neil, but we're going to talk about um, both the downtown bike network plan and some discussion um, updates on where we're seeing the possibility of temporary lane closures within the DBA district. So Neil, if you could take it from here. Thank you so much, Marta. Uh, good morning to the board. Um, I'm gonna really quickly share my screen and I'm gonna try and go through the downtown bike network uh, the county project. I'll do it briefly. And if anyone has any questions, please stop me. Uh, so let's see. Okay, there we are. So um, just for a point of reference and clarification, the downtown bike network, um, as proposed by the county, is about two and a half miles. Um, if you can see right here, Northeast First Avenue is going north. It goes from Southeast First Street all the way up to Northeast 11th Street, which will get us to the eventual under deck I-395 Signature Bridge open space and then um, returning back on North Miami Ave, going south, all the way from, again, Northeast 11 Terrace, or Northwest 11 Terrace, sorry, to Southeast 2nd Street. And then they have the East-West connecting streets, 5th Street going east, and 6th Street going west. Uh, this project is about $2 million anticipated budget. One million of that is coming from the county. Another million of that is coming from District 2, uh, Commissioner Russell's uh, scooter pilot program. Uh, the county shared with us about, I think it was a week or two ago, their updated design plans. Uh, since then, their county's own construction division and procurement department requested additional specs, uh, quantities, details, general notes, and MOT plans. Uh, Julio Guevara from the county expects have, to have all that wrapped up by the first or second week in May. As far as schedule, uh, the county would like to have their contractor selected via invitation to bid by July. They'd like to have the contractor mobilized in August with the uh, goal of having construction started in September. Uh, they need to do that for their fiscal year spending. Their anticipated schedule is uh, between three to four months, obviously weather depending during hurricane season, um, but they're looking to wrap it up hopefully in December 2020, but more realistically, you know, January of 2021. Uh, the DDA will work uh, to procure physical barriers uh, to be implemented in the buffer lanes. Uh, we all know that if we don't have physical barriers, and by that I mean uh, landscape planters, rails, a combination thereof, we don't have them, the bike lanes won't work. Uh, delivery trucks, uh, Amazon, DHL, UPS will park there. Uh, Uber, Lyft will park there. Even our residents will park their own cars there. So we know that's important. Uh, the other next step is we tried to have a walkthrough back, I believe, in February or March. It didn't work because of COVID, so we, are re we have rescheduled. It is scheduled for next Monday at 2 p.m. Um, we will send out an email to those uh, stakeholders who want to attend the meeting to bring their own uh, protective equipment, you know, masks, uh, maintain proper social distancing, and we'll try to walk as much of the network as possible so we can have a good discussion as to you know what what's what's uh, design is right, what's not, and then what protection is needed to really make this an effective and you know truly usable bike network. Uh, does anyone have any questions? I want to thank uh, Commissioner Higgins for her leadership on moving this project forward. It hasn't been a easy one to push, so we really appreciate the, the funding and um, the advocacy to make it happen. So. 
Yeah. I don't know and if you have any other. Uh, I, actually, I do have just a, a few comments, um, not on the bike lane, because I think we'll be able to, once we walk through, we'll be able to make sure if all of the questions um, that can possibly be resolved from the last walkthrough are resolved in the new set of plans. But um, we also have um, some funding to do sidewalk repairs on First Avenue, which is part of the bike. Um, you know, the, the bike network that would go down to Fort Dallas Park. And so Nancy and I and DTPW and Parks walked First Avenue all the way from kind of where it dead ends at the river up to uh, this project would go pretty much to uh, Wolfson campus for sidewalk repairs and also um, some beautification. They might be able to put in a few extra trees. That street is just chock a block with, you know, FPL underground uh, stuff. So you might think there isn't a tree there, but when we look under there, there's a big utility box. So they're looking also at perhaps, um, you know, what can be done that might not be a tree. So hopefully, not hopefully, we have to make sure these, you know, these two little pots of money come together. So it might be that that part of the lower part of the bike network on First Avenue becomes both a better bike experience and a better pedestrian experience. That's wonderful. Um, I know that Carlos Cruz Casas is also on uh, in the meeting. Is there anything, Carlos, that you would like to update us with or share? All right, that's like maybe no. Okay. Um, all right, wonderful. <laughs> um, okay, so Neil, can we talk a little bit about the uh, the temporary lane closures? Absolutely. Let me get this up here. Okay, again, for anyone who isn't aware, um, you know, over over a month ago with the state home quarantine with city and county parks uh, being closed, obviously they're starting to phase them out and reopen them. But, you know, there was the issue brought up, thankfully by uh, Gary, as far as, you know, we have all these people who are trying to get outside, maintain healthy, but also maintain proper social distancing. And now they're crowded on sidewalks. Um, and if ever there was a good time to temporarily close lanes to allow for bike and pedestrian access, and do it in a safe manner, this would be the time. So if I can scroll in a little bit, um, this was the downtown bike network map that was uh, part of uh, a meeting that was held here at the DDA um, with some of the stakeholders. And so when we look at some of these routes, um, especially falling back on the resolution that was passed to the board last week to look at what it will take to open up some of the vehicular lanes temporarily to pedestrian and bike access. The low hanging fruit, um, as you can see on this map, or actually from past experience, is actually with FDOT, just because they do have an exper uh, experience, um, especially on Biscayne Boulevard with closing down um, four lanes of traffic, um, closing down an entire northbound lanes, and then rerouting traffic uh, to the southbound lanes and, and, and you know, uh, making it work that way. Um, I've spoken to quite a few different people. Uh, Ray Martinez, the Ultra, Frankie Ruiz, Miami Marathon, Jose Solano from Bayfront Park. They all use the same company, All American Barricades, and they put out not only the barriers, uh, north and south, ingress and egress, uh, they also do all the MOT plans, they pull the FTOT permits. So they are preparing quotes for us on how to do that on Biscayne Boulevard and looking also at Brickell. But there's also east-west connectors as well. So when we get down to Brickell, if I can get this thing to work, here we go. Um, you know, there's Southeast 13th Street, Coral Way, there's uh, 7th and 8th Street going east and west that would connect, you know, towards Brickell City Center. Um, obviously, it's a little bit more difficult. They don't have quite as much room, whereas Biscayne Boulevard had, obviously has a lot more room and capacity to do so. But to get people east and west and north and south would be, you know, the best way to do it. And also to connect to the Venetian, because as the county has been sharing with us, the Venetian is getting heavily overcrowded as well. Um, we do need to follow up with Public Works. Uh, at the city to see what it will take to do it, um, you know, on the city streets, especially Southeast First, Northeast First, and Flagler. Um, and then I spoke with Julian from the county as well, since we're already going to be doing these permanent bike lanes on Northeast First and South Miami Ave, what it would take to close them off one lane temporarily. Um, at least it's a good way to test the, the streets and give people an appetizer of what's to come. Um, we, I've also spoken to many different advocacy groups. They're all in support of this. 
uh, whether it's Miami-Dade Trail Alliance, Rails the Trails, Transit Alliance, The Underline, Dade Heritage Trust. I was just speaking to uh, Fritz and the Flagler bid. Everyone's on board for this to happen. They were all willing to help as far as communications, advocacy, outreach. Uh, we just need to have a plan uh, in place for what it's going to cost from FDOT and uh, all American barricades to do this or what it's going to take for city and county public works. Um, so I will, as soon as I have more information, I will uh, share it with the entire board. Um, and I guess what I heard at the last board meeting is we really need to focus on a specific ask of what streets. Um, so I'll, I'll open it up and then to the board for discussion on that. Hey, Neil, it's Franklin. Um, question. What is the philosophy of, on those proposed lanes that end right at the slip going up the scheme? Yeah, the connection there. I, I think yeah, because, because 395. Right. As uh, Biscayne uh, Boulevard, and this is the whole kind of uh, thought process behind Biscayne Green, is that you have for an eight block period, you have eight lanes and then it pinches back down to six lanes. It's not to say right. it could not continue a bike lane but it just becomes a little bit more difficult to remove lanes permanently for uh, bike infrastructure. Of course, it's obviously very needed to get people all the way to the Venetian or MacArthur, yeah. um, but it's, I think that's just where the pinch point happens after 8th Street. Thank you. I'd like to um, just thank Gary <laughs> real quickly for, uh, for advocating for this and bringing, bringing it up. Um, uh, numerous times and so I just want to give a shout out because this is really important um, and there are so many cities that have taken steps to do this across the world and across the country um, and I think you know th th there, there's really no reason not to um, so I just want to thank Gary for his advocacy and, and Commissioner Higgins for the support um, and, and if there's I'm curious if there's any further comments. Hi Marta this is Spencer I have a comment. Go for it. Um, this is great, and I and I and I like it as well. Um, I, I think one thing we need to make sure of is that the planning staff of the city is fully aware of this and um, conveying these networks to um, developers who are coming in for entitlements. Uh, my experience when I do this for my clients is that, um, you know, the bike lanes are not something that are, are raised initially and e e even sometimes during the entitlement process. And, and what happens is, um, you know, people can get in entitlements for an improvement and propose something completely different or conflicting with, uh, you know, a plan like this. And uh, it's not until you get into like a building permit review with public works or something that it comes up at the 11th hour and then everyone's scrambling to like figure out how to reconcile the approved plans with what, you know, DDA or the bike, you know, network wants. And so um, I know, I know you've done a lot of outreach in terms of like getting people to buy into this particular plan, but um, I think it's really important for, those in the regulated community, like developers, uh, to be able to understand that this is something that has to be done and they have to design around. And in some cases, you know, perhaps pay for or supplement, not, not in this particular case, but maybe in other cases as we're trying to connect this whole network. Um, so that, that's just some important follow-up I would suggest that you guys make sure to do. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, this is actually a county plan and will become codified if if I'm not mistaken. So it'll be part of the street plans when you pull when you go to design. But right, but 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 Gary, like when when I take an entitlement to the city, nobody at the city knows or cares about what the county plan says. Yeah. And they don't they don't even review it or, or much less you know, look at it. And so, you know, it, it it's one of the most common issues I have to deal with uh, for my clients is reconciling um, two different requirements, one from the city and one from the county. Hmm. They don't effectively communicate. And so I think the more that we can help bridge that gap and make sure this is 
something that everybody knows and everybody is like talking about and everyone's requiring, um, the, the better off we'll be and the more effective and easy it will be to implement this in a way that, um, you know, is going to, is going to be effective for downtown. Great point. We should definitely find a yeah. way to get the city to ba piggyback on this and copy it. We will, we will do that. And, um, Carlos Cruz Casas just, uh, yeah. writing a note that he wants to, I don't know if you would like to say anything, Carlos, uh, Yvonne, if you can unmute him. Actually, before before Carlos um, chimes in, can we read a couple of the comments um, that were made before? Because I think he might want to address those, if that's possible, Yvonne. Unmute myself. Okay. Uh, so we have a question from Colin Worth, and he says, is there any opportunity to get the federal <coughs> buildings to move the Jersey barriers out of the roadway on Northeast First Avenue, North Miami Avenue? North 5th Street and North 3rd Street. So uh, can you guys hear me? Yes. Uh, so, so yeah, there's something that we would like to pursue at this point. You know, it, it, we believe it's going to take a little bit longer of a process and probably uh, we need to have all the agencies who are working together, getting your support in order to do that what might be of interest. Uh, I, I say that, um, let's 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 put that into into action uh, and perhaps with this network be at the ground level first can help us make the case for that to to happen um but that's something that we'd like to explore as well yeah and and um carlos we we did explore that with um the, the college and the federal government back a few years ago mm -hmm. um and so we'll, we'll revisit those conversations because what we were told back then is um it had to be an act of congress to do that and so maybe um, I, Commissioner Higgins, if maybe you can help us move yeah. that forward. Yeah. Okay, I didn't, I, that's all the information I need. So we'll get together with your team and, and I'll find somebody that will help get that accomplished for us. Yes, thank Can't you. Can't promise thank anything, you. but we'll we'll feed it up the food chain. And, thank and you. And Christina, just to follow up with that, I asked Wanda, Wanda has a contact at the federal building, Wanda Mendez, our Flagler PIO. So she's already started that conversation. So uh, we can obviously coordinate with everyone and get a presentation in front of them to show them the long-term plan and what we're asking. Okay. Yeah, so just whenever, Neil, you get with Nancy, when we have our deck that's ready, we'll present it to, um, at a min minimum, Congresswoman Shalala. If we need to do anybody else, we'll do that too. We'll do, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Madam Chair, we have another question from Maria Cristina Chiquin. Uh, are there any current plans, perhaps phase two of the downtown bike network to connect to the Venetian? And I see that you answered, not that you were aware. I don't know if anybody else wants to chime in. I think so, Neil, uh, Neil addressed that a little bit in his comments. Um, I don't know, Neil, if you want to just reiterate it. Sure, it just gets trickier, as Franklin pointed out, um, you know, north of the American Airlines arena, yeah. because this game begins to pinch back. It's not to say it cannot be done, um, but we, I, I think it would be behoove us if we're going to close down this game to at least do one lane all the way north to the Venetian to at least try it right now and get people aware of it because it is a very dangerous uh, intersection, especially the vehicular lane that goes on to 395. Um, I've driven it myself many times on a bike and it is pretty scary. It's one of the more dangerous intersections in all of downtown. No, understood. But I think that Maria is referring to the bike lane network, not on Biscayne. Um, but I, so I think if, if, if for the, the, the more permanent um, network that, mm -hmm. that, because then you would, you would connect it from first or wherever. I'm not sure. <laughs> mm -hmm. Since it's, since it's too, right. So, so on that real quick, it is not part of the design plans that are going for construction. Uh, it is part of the bigger picture uh, connectivity of the bike lane uh, in downtown Miami. Um, so I guess, uh, as Maria mentioned, that is definitely a very appropriate phase two that we would like to explore. Thank you, Carlos. And I think we have one more comment, correct? Yes, we have a comment from Chris Rupp. Uh, would be great to eliminate parking on Brickell Bay Drive and add temporary bike lanes from Southwest 13th Street to Southwest 8th Street. And I, I, 
Okay. Um, I don't know. I was going to say it. We can't see the map, Neil. I don't know if that's, that's part of the plan. Um, Let me bring it back up. And, th and this is, this is on not, this is now for the temporary lane closures, correct? Can we, can we segregate the two no, conversations? Yes. Exactly. Yeah, those are two different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's, it's all lumping into one. Um, uh, I believe Christine is talking about the temporary lane closures and me, and I know Neil did mention 13th street. So if you just want to touch on that one, one second, Neil. Turn my screen again, so that I can find it. Right. So this was the, this is the map. Again, this was the proposed, uh, not the uh, county project, um, but yes, 13th is not shown, but it could be a very good connector. Uh, it is proposed that Brickle Bay Drive would be uh, at some point a permanent uh, connector. Chris Rupp, do you know if the on-street parking is owned by the MPA along there? Assuming so, but. Yeah. Let's assume yes for a second. We'll, we'll, we'll assume yeah. yes. Um, we can definitely explore it for sure. Okay. Can you scroll right. up to the CBD? Because I, I, I don't think we got a copy of this map. Can you scroll up to the... It was included in the package, right, Is yesterday? <clears throat> I don't know. I can't find it. And, and actually, um, just for you know, history purposes, this was done through a, a partnership with the, the city, the county, and stakeholders back, I guess, what, now over a year ago, right, Neil? Um, yeah. And we presented it to the committee. It was a while ago, but we wanted to just remind everybody um, of the plan of, of the recommendations, have input, and also um, based on the resolution that was passed on the, by the board on Friday, kind of tie it in together in the areas that make sense um, and get recommendations now just to, to be on the same Great. page. So let me make a couple of recommendations then. Um, uh, Neil, I think the actual low hanging fruit is Flagler Street, which F dot, we don't need F dot input. That's owned by the city of Miami. Yeah, and thank, uh, you, thank you for mentioning that, Gary. Um, and I'll let you finish, and then I'll chime in on that one. Go ahead. Uh, North River Drive uh, is a good option. Um, obviously, Biscayne Boulevard. Uh, there is an opportunity, I think, to look at a, um, a loop that goes uh, across uh, Southeast First Street between 2nd and 3rd, and then 3rd Avenue between 1st and Flagler, I mean, I can send you this de de detail a little bit more to, 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 for you to look at. That'd be great. But those are definitely two recommendations. I know that I, I'd really like to see this get buttoned up so we can start pushing on the, this resolution. Okay, yeah. Fritz was just mentioning that to me this morning, but if you could send those details, that'd be great. Sure. Yeah, and, and that's and very, I, it's very helpful for the, to focus too, um, Gary. So I appreciate you bringing up the city streets because I, I think that is the low hanging fruit given that the county's doing um, the bike network um, implementation coming up, we can focus on Flagler and, and the streets that you mentioned if it's the will of the committee to do so um, as it relates to the resolution that was passed on Friday. And um, I do, I do, Gary, I, I think the idea of having a loop is a great idea because I think initially when this item came up, you know, there was some discussion of having, you know, just, just closing down Third Street, which Third Street's a wonderful street, but that's not really helpful if you're trying to take a, walk or get anywhere so like making sure that people are kind of connecting and have some length to do so um and doing that via loop i think is really helpful um and, and the direction that we should be moving yeah and um part of the resolution from friday also mentioned um cafes and restaurants that eventually once the city opens um will most likely have a limited you know, space because of social distancing and you know we're hearing about the 25 percent um occupancy kind of things that are, they're discussing right now. And so um, I believe it was Alicia uh, Cervera, board member that mentioned that, to include that as part of our consideration when we're, when we're thinking about closing streets to allow those uh, cafes and restaurants to have more space. Um, it aligns with the Flagler Street project that's moving forward eventually. Um, and I've asked the city uh, administration to consider it as part of their recovery plan because it, it makes sense, there's a nexus there and they've agreed to do that. And um, they've invited me to serve on the task force for this recovery uh, effort. So I just wanted to share that and that I'll, I'll be making sure to push that through 
um, that process as well. Great. Um, so let me just, I'm going to play Yvonne for a second, <laughs> if Yvonne allows. Um, so there's just a couple comments that um, I want to touch on, and then uh, we do need to keep moving because we have quite a few other um, items on the agenda. Uh, Dana Wall mentioned um, that it would be it would be great uh, to to allow um, some of the businesses in uh, in in the downtown and Brickell area. So not just for the pedestrian and cyclist purposes, but also to help um, uh, uh, some small businesses, particularly restaurants, as they reopen. Um, to have additional space that they can use as, as their, you know, kind of like for sidewalk cafes or, or something like that, um, if we were able to repurpose some lanes. Um, I just want to mention that that was a sentiment um, that came up during our, our meeting on Friday, um, and it was very well received. The idea, that, the idea being that um, restaurants moving forward will likely open, um, but they're going to open in limited capacity. And being able to extend some amount of a public right of way to help them get back on their feet, and it, it increases the capacity of the uh, business that they're able to provide, um, and it and it does so in a way that also achieves this uh, more pedestrian, bicycle friendly environment. And so to that end, I I'm sorry, yeah. uh, uh, no. Brickle Ave um, South Miami Avenue, uh, Neil uh, by Mary Brickle Village. That's a, I think that's a street that could really be explored as a, you know, yeah. it's so congested and it's got so many restaurants around it. Perfect. And that one's added um, as part of the reso from Friday. That's one of the uh, priority yeah. corridors. So we're going to be exploring that. And thank you, Martha, for just uh, for reading that and for, and for clarifying it. Um, we're going to also have the staff canvas the district too, just to make sure that we're looking at areas that make sense for business reopening and, and taking some public right away. So I just wanted to mention that. And I, and I do want to flag that Carlos Cruz Casas um, uh, chimed in and said that the county would like to be supportive um, and that with temporary facilities and they could start today. So if we can make sure to have them looped in and be collaborating with them and, you know, move this quickly, there's no reason why it shouldn't move quickly. Um, but with that, if it's okay with everyone, oh, Gary. Um, no, no, sorry, just on the state side, there. I know that we have the support of uh, Senator Pizzo and Representative Fernandez at least. So. We've got a great team. Um, you're right, should, should happen quickly. Thank you. Um, just also, it's interesting to sort of watch with the governors, whether you agree with him opening this, you know, on Monday or not. Um, he is being more flexible in other parts of the state about outdoor seating in restaurants. And, and the city of Miami is, is obviously and importantly being, being very cautious in the reopening. But if we could get some of these uh, sidewalks and get a lane that would possibly on a street that has a lot of restaurants, I'm thinking Southeast First, right, is, is one, that could really help them um, possibly uh, figure out how they can social distance and create some space that is outside rather than inside. And if we could resolve that in the next month, that may or may not, I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to dictate the timeline for the city of Miami. That's obviously... Um, their commission's job, but um, but that would get us ahead of the restaurant opening and, and provide that flexibility that the city of Miami might be able to include in their reopening instructions. Great. All righty. Um, okay, so if we can move on, um, let's go ahead. Actually, let's because it's getting close to 10 o'clock um, and there's still a couple of items, can we jump over to a resolution that we need to uh, vote on very quickly, and then we can um, jump right back to the kiosk presentation. Um, so the resolution that the resolution that we have uh, in front of us here um, is actually something that had come up. Uh, I want to say months ago, um, and it and it had to do with this game green and a match that the DDA had committed to, but for just technical just reasons, um, I, I think it just. Didn't never made the resolution never made it onto any agenda. So um, this is in retrospect. So the 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 resolution is um, it's just it's basically a match to support uh, the transportation project uh, for Biscayne Green. Christina, I don't know if you want to add any additional comment. Um, yeah, it's it's it, um, the lane elimination study that we're actually in the middle of right now for Biscayne Green. FDOT gave us uh, through the city a tap grant to accomplish that, but 
those tap grants always require a match. And so the $30,000 is allocated in the budget already. It's been discussed many times by the board. This is really just a formality because the allocation wasn't approved by the board when the JPA was approved. So it's a, it's a cleanup basically. Um, and so if you have any questions, happy to answer it, but um, that's what that resolution is. Great. So um, if there aren't any other comments, um, if we can take a vote on the resolution. Um, so uh, I guess we could just chime I'll in I'll move with approval of the resolution, Mrs. Spencer. Thank you. Second. Franklin. Thank you, Franklin. Um, everybody in favor? Aye. Aye. And any opposed? Wonderful. All right, so that motion passes. Thank you for entertaining that. Um, and then let's just go back to the kiosk presentation. All right, and we do have, is we have Anna? Yes, wonderful. Okay. Okay, so Anna, I think the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me today. My name is Anna Behrman, um, and I am presenting on behalf of Ike Smart City um, about the interactive kiosks. So you may be familiar with the kiosks because they are installed in neighboring Coral Gables, but I do apologize that this is the first time um, that we are speaking, but I'm really glad that we were, are able to connect now. So last week, um, we received city commission approval to install interactive kiosks throughout the public right of way um, and on city owned property throughout the city of Miami. Um, and I was able to speak with Elena and Kim earlier this week and they thought it would be helpful for us to, or for me to present to you guys um, and show you a short video kind of explaining the interface um, and the functionality and then answer a few specifics to the city um, about the project and answer any questions that you guys have. So if it's okay, I'm gonna um, play a short video and then we can get into more details. So let me share my screen here. And I think I have it if, okay. Oh, if you have it, we can do it that way. That's okay, well. let's just see if the audio works. Let's go ahead. Let me know if I need to stop. In the digital age, how do innovative cities connect with residents and visitors? Meet Ike, the interactive kiosk experience. Ike is a breakthrough citizen engagement platform that helps cities, business improvement districts, and destination marketing organizations communicate with the public, encourage a pedestrian-oriented environment, and tell the story of their city. Ike launched in Denver with the goal of building a wayfinding and city communication system for the digital age and delivering it in a self-sustaining business model, requiring no investment from the city. Today, we're scaling the platform nationwide. Designed in concert with Pentagram, Ike's sophisticated design complements the aesthetics of any city, incorporating local branding both on and off screen, offering kinetic lighting options, and allowing for customizable content. Ike is fully ADA compliant, adjusting the interface for users in wheelchairs and accommodating other special needs. The system is multilingual and available in any language at the push of a button. Ike is immediately familiar to any user of a smartphone. Simple touch gestures activate the system and provide everything a user needs, all in one curated place. Through our ever-expanding series of applications, Ike delivers social equity, drives discovery, enables navigation to businesses and civic resources, encourages economic development, and enhances public safety. Ike improves connectivity and accessibility to underserved areas through free Wi-Fi and increased cellular coverage, and provides access to civic resources, job opportunities, safe shelters, and other social services like food support and addiction recovery resources. Ike's wayfinding encourages city exploration with mapping to area destinations and real-time transit feeds for bus, rail, streetcar, ferry, bike, and car share services. Ike functions as a visible two-way communication platform for the immediate deployment of important information. Ike can quickly broadcast emergency messages and critical updates and an optional emergency call system, high-definition security cameras, and air quality monitor enhance public safety. Ike can provide anonymized data, including optional pedestrian counts, usage, and dwell times. Ike's customized content management system and sophisticated geolocation capability ensure that each Ike is optimized for its location and audience. With Ike, streets come alive. Define your city. 
connect with your citizens. This is I. Okay, so I hope everyone was able to hear that okay. Um, that does a better job of explaining what the kiosks look like and how they are you know, able to be interacted with than I can. So I hope that was helpful. Um, one important piece of background information on this project is that we are actually partnered with First American Telecom. Um, the city actually asked us to join into a partnership with them because as many of you probably know, they have phone booths scattered throughout the city. Um, and they were hoping to, and I think that they presented uh, to the board, their plans to actually convert some of those phone booths into interactive kiosks. And um, it made sense for there to be, you know, sort of a cohesive product throughout the city. And so they asked that we um, enter into an agreement to deploy our product, Ike, uh, together. So that's kind of just to close the loop on conversations that you might have um, had or heard about in the past. So the next steps here are really, you know, we, we received commission ap approval next week um, or last week. We are planning next week or in the following couple of weeks to have a sit down meeting with the city manager um, to talk in more detail about, you know, the permitting process and just deployment plans in general throughout the city. Um, we manufacture, install, maintain, um, and operate the kiosks at no cost to the city, and we're sharing a portion of that revenue back with the city. And the city is planning to distribute a portion of the revenue that they receive, not only to the general fund, but also to selected organizations, including the DDA. Um, and that will be prorated based on how many, uh, or proportionate to how many kiosks are installed within each organization's boundaries. Um, and so we would be working closely with your with GDA um, on siting and which locations make sense. And the initial phase of locations um, that we are you know, going to propose will be actually swapping existing phone booths for this more um, advanced technology. So you know, it won't be cluttering the sidewalk in a way that it'll be replacing an existing um, infrastructure that already exists. And we will, of course, um, you know, with working with you, uh, make sure to consider all of our normal um, siting guidelines such as ADA compliancy and adequate path of travel in the right of way. And that will be, you know, we'll work with the civil engineer to make sure that every site is technically feasible um, for install before installing a kiosk and submitting for permit. Um, the last thing I want to mention before, you know, I open up for questions is the content opportunities for the DDA. So um, I know that in the, there's been a relationship in the past with First American Telecom where, and, and I heard about the, the recent COVID-19 ad that was provided by the DDA that was posted on um, the, static, the static screens on the telephone booths. And I just wanted to mention that um, those same types of content opportunities are also available with Ike. So one of the eight slides in the ad loop um, are dedicated to the city for content. And this, we'll have to work with the city to see how they want to allocate that um, content. But my expectation would be that they would be open to uh, allowing the DDA to use that space within on the kiosks within the DDA's boundaries. And so, um, you know, we can put any type of messaging that is you know necessary on, on those kiosks in that one ad ad loop slot. Um, I know there was also discussions about um, when they were they were talking about uh, converting some of the phone booths into the kiosk product. You know, doing some fun things with kinetic lighting, like making the um, kiosk you know shine pink during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. And I just wanted to mention that that's also an opportunity on our kiosks. We have a kinetic lighting strip at the bottom of the kiosk. Um, it can change colors for games, events, um, you know, anything that you wish. And every single kiosk, because we have built our software in-house, every kiosk is geo-aware. It'll be pulling in all of the local businesses in the area automatically into the kiosk, um, into each kiosk. Everyone will look different because the um, listings are sorted based on proximity to that kiosk location. And we are always willing to talk about adjusting the content if things aren't look, you know, if hours are incorrect for a restaurant and they're, um, you know, we're always willing to kind of work through those changes together. And so I will be, um, along with my colleague, uh, Keisha Garrett, who's not on the call today, 
uh, the account managers for the city of Miami. And so any questions, follow up questions can come to me and I'll be more than happy to um, answer them and help you guys with whatever you need as we work through this together. I have, I have one um, quick question. Um, thank you so much, Anna, for the presentation um, and, and for uh, working with us moving forward on this project. Um, it was brought up at the board meeting, I believe, um, you know, touch screen uh, kiosks right now may, may be an issue because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic. And so is there a voice activation option for these? Um, just wanted to mention that. That's a great question. So there's a few things that we're doing during uh, this pandemic. We understand that it's a, it's a very strange time and we don't want to make anyone feel uncomfortable. And so the first thing to note is that we are contractually obligated and, you know, we will clean the kiosks with a disinfecting solution seven days a week. And that's during this pandem pandemic and, you know, every single day after that we're under this, this contract. Um, but in addition to that, we have made a promise to the city of Miami as part of the resolution um, to, to do one of two things in order to make sure that there is no virus on the screens. One is either do a UV light that will kill the virus um, after each individual use. And the second option is a coating on the screen that makes it impossible. And it's, you know, the, the science behind this is much more advanced than the way that I'm describing it, but it will make it impossible for the virus to live on the screen. And so we will do one of those two items in addition to uh, daily cleanings and that will, and the daily cleanings will continue even after the pandemic is over. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions uh, for Anna? Hi, this yeah, is Spencer. Uh, go ahead, Spencer. Thanks, Gary. Um, is there is there a map showing the locations of these kiosks at this point? Um, and if not, can we see a map once it's developed before these are implemented? Absolutely. So I actually, I, I had a call with um, Elena and Kim earlier this week and I sent them a preliminary phase one map, which is based only on the fat phone booth locations. So our first locations um, that we would consider will be these swaps um, of existing phone booths. And so I can distribute that to the group or Elena and Kim can distribute that to the group. And I mentioned to them that we can work to, you know, I want you guys to review them, make sure you feel good about them, give us feedback. We can talk about, you know, additional locations. Um, and so that's as far as we've gotten, you know, the, the, I think there's probably about 20, locate 20 to 25 locations on the map that I sent. And that would be just the first, you know, phase. Um, but as, you know, time goes on, I want this to be an ongoing feedback loop where we're not deploying a kiosk that you guys don't know about, that you guys didn't talk, we didn't talk about. And, and this is something that, you know, in every city that we're in, we're, we have a process like this. And so I feel confident that we will be able to select locations that, you know, we all feel, feel good about and that makes sense for um, the DDA. And so um, thank you, Spencer, for bringing that up. We did, I, I shared that preliminary map um, in my board update a few days back. Um, but that being said, Anna and, and the company is committed to working with us moving forward. So I've asked the staff to canvas the district um, to recommend locations to, to the company. Um, and so we'll be working on that and we'll present that these preliminary locations um, to the board. And I guess hopefully by by this next board meeting, um, that way the board can chime in, but also working really closely with the company moving forward. So I just wanted to mention that. So thank you. Let's be sure we also have um, property owner um, approval. If you're going to put these in front of somebody's property, let's make sure we're talking to the building owner. Nothing's worse than having something pop up all of a sudden, unexpected. Um, I have some questions about the unit, and if, if real quick, who manages the content? So we manage all of the content we actually have. Um, so both on the advertising side and on um, the sort of uh, uh, the actual like content, the city specific content side. So um, we have one portion of our business is actually um, advertising sales. And so we have a um, advertising sales team that, you know, works with national 
ad agencies all throughout the country, and, and we will be man managing that whole process. Um, there are restrictions on the things that we are allowed to advertise on the kiosk per our agreement with the city, and also per the amendments to Chapter 54 of the city code. And so we will, of course, be complying with um, all of those uh, restrictions. And then the actual city content, so, you know, locations, um, you know, restaurants and um, businesses and social services locations, we use a proprietary algorithm um, and software to pull all of that data automatically into the kiosk. And so actually all we do in our content management system is plug in a latitude and longitude and all of that auto populates into the kiosk. However, um, we also will be working with you guys to make sure that um, you know, if any changes need made, we can um, adjust that content through our content management system. And we will also, um, we also grant our city partners credentials to actually log into that if, if they prefer to make adjustments themselves. But um, it is a fully turnkey solution where um, there's really nothing required from the city to manage any of that content. We kind of do it all in house. Will these have an emergency phone on them? They will. So there is an emergency call button um, on the side of the kiosk that once you push it, it will um, create two-way communication between the user and the dispatcher, um, as well as security cameras um, above the emergency call button and at the top of each kiosk to sort of capture the scene around it um, if there is an emergency incident. Um, are there charging stations on these? I've seen some in other cities that have charging stations. We do not do charging stations because it creates, um, it, it can sometimes cause loitering and people to sort of uh, post up outside of the kiosk and that kind of prevents other people from being able to take advantage of the functionality. And so, and it also sometimes um, encourages vandalism. And Great. so we have decided to not have that functionality on our kiosk. And then my last question is, what, what percentage of the content that's displayed is advertising? So when the kiosk is not in use, it's going through a loop of eight slides. Um, and we have dedicated one of those ad slides plus any remnant unsold space, which in the first couple of years as we're ramping up, there might be um, more unsold space than later, uh, later on in the contract. So that is what, so the one space is dedicated to the, um, the city. And then once the kiosk is in use, that ad loop actually resizes to the top uh, third of the screen and all of the content underneath that top third of the screen um, is non-advertising, non-sponsored city content. Um, so it depends on if it's in interactive mode or in passive mode. Great, thank you. Of course. I have, I have one question. Um, what about Wi-Fi capability? Does it have Wi-Fi capability? It does. So it has Wi-Fi capability um, up to a, a 50 to 75 foot radius around the kiosk. And so, um, and, and this is actually something kind of important to note. We have a commitment um, to deploy kiosks. When we have under 30 kiosks in the city, 10% of them will be in what are deemed social equity locations. Um, so to make sure that there's an equitable dis distribution throughout the city. And then once we are over 50 kiosks, that actually jumps up to 20% of the kiosk locations will be in equitable social equity locations. And so the free Wi-Fi is really, really great in, in you know, especially on those social equity sites because we can provide um, connectivity to, you know, people that might not have it otherwise. All right, thank you. Thank you, Anna, for the presentation. Um, I think we, I, um, just real quick, um, I think that there's an interesting opportunity to also um, work with the county um, on this. And so, Carlos, I don't know if you want to chime in very quickly. I know you've looked quite a lot at kiosks and, and these things, but if there's an opportunity to work with the county um, via the DDA, for the city and the county to work together, that might be wonderful. Definitely, definitely more than happy to, to entertain that. Oh, that's my son, I apologize for that. But uh, the, yeah, I think uh, most importantly, when we put public transportation information there is critical. And if we can integrate the wayfinding approach, uh, into this that would be great as well so i'm more than happy to work together with you guys that would be great we would love that as well all righty 
Thank you. Thank you, Anna, again. Um, and uh, I know Christina and staff will continue being involved um, as this moves forward and, and we'll look forward to updates um, and a map um, as Spencer requested as, yes. we, as this moves forward. All right, can, thank you. Can I just ask a quick question? Does that mean all these useless phone booths around downtown are gonna be gone? Like all of them or? So not necessarily all of them, but definitely, some, a, definitely a good um, chunk of them. They're well, still they advertising to sell. I know, but they are in, I mean, they, first of all, a lot of them were put in place. I mean, I don't know how long they've been here there since Jesus. They're still part of a pilot project. Yeah. So, so a lot of them are, are in very inappropriate places and I would just love to, to see them. Just because there's a phone booth in the location, don't assume it's a good location, in other words. We have, <laughs> I'm reviewing a map and we are on top of it, but thank you. We appreciate that um, insight and, and we will definitely be replacing um, a lot of them with, you know, an advanced technology. So we're excited about that and we'll make sure to cite them in a way that maybe makes a bit more sense. Um, yeah. for them. And yeah. I don't, I don't know, Marta, if we want to add this to, you know, it's, it's obviously not a crisis item, but, you know, we may want to make a recommendation that whatever of these sort of ratty, falling apart, rusting phone booths that are roaming around, you know, the DDA district that we actually ask the city to um, to try to work on a plan to remove them so that we have one consistent look look and feel. Um, no, that makes absolute sense. Um, yeah, definitely. I, um, yeah. On the same page there. We don't want to clutter the right away any more than... No, I mean, it's already, cluttered. you know. Yeah. Already I don't know if we're going to be... I, I guess, um, is that a, is that a state issue there um, about the phone booths? I mean, I've heard this and I don't really know, um, me, you know how that all kind of evolved, but... There I don't know. Preemption issues. Um, there is an agreement that the city has. There's a city code issue. Um, as Gary said, this is a pilot program that's been around for about 20 years. Um, I wasn't joking. <laughs> there are uh, a number of moving parts. Um, I know when this um, kiosk project first came to the city, there was discussions about removing some of the phone booths, but there was um, some pushback on that. Um, so there's there's a number of moving parts, but I can certainly work with you to follow up with the city. Yeah, thank you. And I think um, with Anna's partnership in the company, we all agree that we don't want more clutter in the right away. So appreciate that. Strong. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, maybe even if it can be a, some sort of a trade, right? Like, okay, we want to put it here for, <laughs> for each one. So, okay. Um, great, wait. So let's talk real quick about the pit stop program. I know that Jennifer has some updates for us. Um, and then after that, we'll talk about the, the dog spot and we should be done. So we'll try to wrap up by 10.30. So Jennifer, if you're ready. Can you guys hear me? Well, yes. yes. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. I'm gonna try to share my screen to see if we can get uh, a graph up. Can you guys see that? Jennifer, if not, I have them. Okay, is it coming up or no? Okay, hold on. Yes, coming. It's coming up? Okay. Yes. Okay, so good morning, everyone. Um, just wanted to share a little bit of updates on the pit stop program. Um, as you can imagine, with all other public restrooms um, closed down uh, because of the COVID-19 um, pandemic going on, um, our Bayfront uh, restrooms have been used, I mean, tremendously. We are getting uses of a, up to 1,800 uses per week, averaging. Um, I wanted to show you on the on the graph that in late February, we closed pit stop one. It was removed from the location. And we have seen a spike in use over at Bayfront Park. This is solely one, you know, one restroom. Um, we've had increased um, with the folks talking to the, the attendants, telling them that they're coming over from Miami Beach because Miami Beach has all their restrooms closed as well. So we're seeing an influx of people coming over the bridge and using our restrooms. Um, we've also spoken to a lot of people who are not from here. They're coming from Virginia, from Boston, from different places, and just migrating down here. Um, we've had a, lot, a couple of instances of, of aggressive behavior at the restrooms. We've had to call police a few times of people not wanting to social distance, people getting aggressive on, you know, different issues. They're, they're not wearing face coverings. Our 
our staff is having some concerns for their own health on those issues. Um, we're keeping the, the restroom, you know, clean, safe, and we're, we're making sure that we are offering this service from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. according to the city curfew. And, and I'll else? just mention, oh, yes, sorry. sorry, Jennifer, just to chime in on those issues that you brought up. I have raised them to the city as part of the um, you know, reopening conversations um, about face coverings in public restrooms as they open parks, that we should make that a requirement. I don't know. Um, Commissioner Higgins, if you can also, um, I don't, or the, I don't know if the counties have these discussions. Yeah. But um, is so going to consider that moving forward. So the the county ordinance, um, or whatever emergency order, um, requires that everybody wear a face covering when they're in a park, and so um, that is there is the city can be stricter about it, but it cannot be looser. So. Theoretically, and this is my guess, I mean, I, I can't speak for Mayor Jimenez, but part of the reason he added that restriction is I think, should we get to the point where we begin to finally open inside spaces, right? As we were talking about, not sure when or how slowly the virus picks the date, you know, we, we don't rush it. But my guess is as we move to a, a broader opening in the coming months, he is going to probably make us wear face coverings, not sure masks, you know, bandana, scarves, whatever we have, um, whenever we're outside. So I can't, you know, I'm, I'm not positive he's gonna do it, but I think this idea of having a mask on in a park is kind of a soft launch of this. So we get used to pretty much when we're going places, when we leave our house, try to put something on, be polite, be respectful. You know, when I wear a mask, I know I'm protecting you. And, and so, I do think if they're, you know, this is a question for Barnaby, um, if they are walking up the entrance of Bayfront Park to use those bathrooms, fundamentally they're in a park and per the county ordinance, I'm sorry, county executive order, it seems as if they would have to wear a mask, but Barnaby probably, I'm not a lawyer as you all know, so maybe we should check with him. No, I would concur with you, Commissioner. Um, you know, there is the requirement that they would have to wear the mask. Um, I don't want to speak for the police department. I think we may have an officer online, but I know that police is hesitant to arrest people. They want to educate people instead and, and advise them why it's proper to have a face covering. Um, but the, the answer to your question is yes, they should be wearing a face mask um, when they're going to a facility in a park. And um, I visited, uh, I know Miami, City of Miami's parks are not yet open, but I also represent a lot of Miami Beach. So I visited all the parks in my district yesterday that were open in Miami Beach. And their park rangers were just doing a really great job. Probably, I'm, you know, I'm guessing here, but 60 to 70% of the people I saw were wearing face masks. And, and then the park ranger would just ride up on his bike and go, welcome back to the parks. We're so glad to have you here and see you outside. But it's a requirement that you wear a mask when you're in your parks. Do you have one with you? Would you mind putting it on? And I bet you eight out of 10 people I saw him do that to had a mask in their pocket. So slowly but surely we're getting to the point where we're realizing this is going to become part of our, I hate to call it new normal. I call it the new abnormal, but um, it did not seem, I mean, I realize there's always people that are aggressive and crazy about I refuse to wear a mask. Um, but in general, a little polite nudge went a long way. Um, and I also realized when you're dealing with the homeless population there, you know, it's, it's harder. It's a harder issue. But theoretically, if they're now in your park, they should have a mask on. Okay. Um, agreed. We just, like you said, we're dealing with some persons experiencing the homelessness. And I think the accessibility to the mask is where the real issue comes in. It's not so much they don't want to wear it, that they don't have access to them. Yeah. And, and so just to chime in, the city did distribute 5,000 masks, I believe, um, to homeless individuals. And they're discussing um, like the next wave of this. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there. And uh, we're following up on all of that. And then the city commission is going to have a discussion around homelessness in general at the, um, during a special meeting that will be scheduled, I guess, probably in the next coming weeks based on the meeting um, yesterday or the day before. And I'm mixing my days. But I just wanted to mention that, that that will be part of that discussion. And then to give a quick update on the expansion, we have um, confirmed with the city 
that the vendor has provided an update from the manufacturers they're ordering the, the trailers from. The trailers should be available in between three to four weeks once they receive the purchase order from the city. The city is simply waiting for the budget um, office to allocate those funds within their line items or however they do that. Once they do that, the city can uh, do the purchase order and send it to the vendor. Once the vendor does that, like I said, three to four weeks. So we're looking at um, maybe a month from now having those uh, expansions out there. Great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Jennifer. And thank you for staying on top of this. And, and a big thank you to your team um, who has been on the front lines and on the street. So every once in a while, I go over, you know, I live and work downtown. So, you know, I see them um, always on the street and they're always friendly um, and helpful. So and during really unprecedented times. So uh, please share with them a big thank you from us do. for all thank of their you. efforts. All right. Um, and then last item that we have, um, we want to uh, chat about the dog spot. Um, and Commissioner, I think this is your item. So yeah, you can I take think, it away. Yeah, sure. And um, Nancy, Nancy may help me. Um, I may, if you don't mind, do a little share the screen sharing. Um, oh, I cannot. Oh, someone else. We have to have Jennifer stop so I can start. While we're, while we're doing that, I just want to give a shout out uh, to Commander Tony Hinson. Um, she's the, uh, she, she's been on the call the entire time um, and uh, often joins the meetings um, when we do them in person. And so just wanted to say hello and thank you for joining us. Um, well, this is one of these projects that we were working very diligently on before coronavirus hit. Um, but have managed to make progress and shout out to Neil, shout out to Christina and shout out to Nancy Jackson from my team. Um, as we all know, there's very limited green space uh, in a lot of the areas of CBD, of the CBD and, and Brickle and Underline is gonna be our first great um, activation of underutilized sort of wasted space uh, for, for community and to get out of the large apartment buildings and office buildings we have here. So the first, um, first Street Metro Mover Station, uh, which actually starts at First Street, ends the station, ends at Second Street, and then across the street there are tracks. Um, the Yotel pad is under construction on the north end of Second Street, but that um, eventually, as soon as they get rid of using that area under the Metro Mover as a construction staging area, that um, will become an open space and a landscape park that uh, the county has already given permission to the city of Miami to manage that space and, and they have an agreement with Yotel Pad to actually make that into an active, uh, safe, safer space. So we'll see how that comes when that construction's finished. Across the street is the station. And so it's, it, um, because the station is on top of the space, little darker and so we began um, to look at ways that we could use that space and can and I think the DDA for a long time thought it might be appropriate to look at having um, a dog park. So our parks department um, began to look at the space I think you can kind of see um, the screen but the idea is they do believe there's enough space there and even enough space to kind of create a curved part where part of the park could be for smaller dogs and part of it could be for larger dogs. And Neil and Nancy have been working uh, with not just our parks department, but also City of Miami Parks Department, who has some really great innovative ideas on materials that are easy to maintain. And so that my suggestion for the next steps for us just to let you know, as far as capital funding, we have the capital funding um, to, to build this. There's sort of one piece, there's a, I'll try and make this big. Can you guys see this? Is that big enough to see? Yeah, yep, okay. Can see. yeah. okay, so there's some fence ideas. Um, I would really like to make some kind of a decorative fencing that is a little nicer. Um, than sort of just the kind of prison bar look. Um, and so it looks like in the current budget, we might be just a little over on that, but I think we can look around for that. But the next step for, for us as a team, and we've been talking about this with Christina, 
uh, to see about the debt teams perhaps opening the park in the morning and closing the park in the evening and then doing the routine maintenance during the day. And so my suggestion is we continue to let uh, Nancy and Neil and Christina work together to come up with a plan because this, the minute we have operations and maintenance plan put in place, we can apply uh, to the FTA to allow us to use this. We can't call it a park, so I don't know, we'll call it like the downtown dog spot or something um, because it's under a station um, that, that we could then proceed to request their permission I don't think it will be a lengthy process to get permission to do that. And then because the total capital of the project is around $600,000, $650,000, um, the, the county believes we may be able to use some existing contracts without having to put it out to bid, um, which would accelerate the construction. Um, and so I realize we're you know, dog parks are, are probably until, you know, until we have a vaccine, probably on the low end of places that'll open. But if we could get it built, uh, this is something we just don't have anywhere in the CBD. And it just takes a derelict space and makes it activated. Um, and we, we will need, you know, lighting and security. We want to lock it at night. But I don't know, Nancy, Neil, you guys have any other thoughts to add? You've been, I'm taking all the, I'm the one doing all the talking, but they're the ones doing all the work. So <laughs> I want to make sure that they're recognized. Right. I just, I, I, oh, sorry. Go ahead, Nancy. Oh, I just wanted to say, yeah, what we're, we're trying to do now, because parks is kind of on emergency operations with food distributions, our county parks. We need their help to finalize the design, but in the meantime, I feel like there's a lot of work we can do on getting the operations and maintenance plan nailed down and getting some budget figures. And then um, Neil has been great about um, connecting with other partners that could help um, even make it better. We know that eventually we're gonna have some kind of private uh, public partnership to keep the park um, going in the long term. We have a ton of buy-in from neighbors. They're so anxious to be involved. And of course, that's our job, I believe. D5's job is to engage the neighbors. The neighbors right adjacent, of course, do have concerns. They're going to be brought along and incorporated their concerns. Um, so I think that part is going to be exciting. And I just feel like it's a natural fit for um, the DDA and us to be doing this together. Um, and I, as, as soon as we can get the FTA process going, I, I'll feel a lot better. I, I feel like that's been a bit of a stumbling block finishing up. So I, I think that's where we're really um, looking for some help from you guys. And, and so just so I'm clear, do they need something formally in writing to, um, to consider this as far as like our commitment to maintain it? So there's a couple things, um, first of like budget allocation from the DDA. I know that $100,000 was put in this fiscal year's budget to help move this along, but moving forward, if it's gonna be a recurring cost, it's something that we probably need to discuss through the budget process, which is gonna happen now in a couple weeks. Um, and so we're trying to hone down on a number of what that, what that is. Um, Nancy's been trying to help with that and Neil as well. So that's one, and then two, what do you need from us um, if we're going to be moving forward on, on maintaining it? Um, you know, it, is it a, a JPA and interlocal, I mean, the mechanism. My, to... my guess is there, there, it would probably be something like that. So we can show the FTA that we have a commitment. We've got the money for the capital, build it out. And we have, we have a joint commitment to maintain and operate um, and keep, you know, keep it clean. And for the folks that live right, I mean, we know before we locked it off, um, you know, we did, you know, we had some security concerns there. And that's why I think a dog park it's a great idea because it, in this neighborhood, it's going to be busy all the time. It's going to be constantly active versus a passive space under there. But I do think we're probably going to have to come up with some operating hours of when it's open and when it's closed. And unfortunately, um, you know, the obvious people to unlock it, right, would be the people unlocking the Metro Mover Station, right? But that is forbidden by the FTA the transit related money, because we used federal funding to build that transit, we, we can't use those folks to be doing non-transit related things. So I happen to think it's a silly rule, but it's a rule. So, so if we, if, if with everyone's agreement, we'll just 
have the team march forward and eventually prepare something, I don't know, Marta, for the board, or you want to come back yeah. to urbanism? It's up to you. I think it can go to the board. Um, unless, Christina, there's an issue with that, I think we're ready to go to the full board, and I think that there's lots of support, and I do want to thank you, um, Nancy, and the rest of your team for staying on this and moving it forward. Yeah, so we have managed to do some non-coronavirus work in the past two months. So <laughs> we got our landscaping plan for First Avenue, the dog park, you know, little by little, we, we get a, and, and, you know, with the team on the bike lanes, all those revisions right. were made, so... You know, sometimes it feels weird working from home, but we are accomplishing things. Mm -hmm. uh, on, the, <laughs> on, that, on that opening and closing, if you need a private partner, um, our security guards do rounds on that corner every 30 minutes. So we're happy to be uh, part of the solution uh, if, if it's helpful. Okay, that's great. May, may I just um, mention one more thing um, regarding what Commissioner Higgins was talking about as far as aesthetics and the fence. Uh, Nancy and I had uh, quite a few conversations before the whole pandemic broke out of um, getting coordinated and involving with Miami-Dade College. Uh, the Idea Center, which is run by Romy Batia, they, have a, they do a semester-long project with their students in collaboration with Moonlighter Make Makerspace and Tom Pubo, uh, where they take a real-life project, get the students activated and involved in it. They come up with designs, benches, murals, uh, fences, all the stuff we're talking about. And they not only design it, then they actually fabricate it with laser cutting, uh, wood workshops, and then they actually install it and implement them. So I would love to get them involved in this because this is a perfect project right around the corner from the actual school. And we could have students doing at no cost some amazing, incredible, you know, design work. So we could really bring this dog park alive. Yeah. Sounds and like that's a great idea. Last but not least, you know, we, we might want to, um, do some commemoration for Francois in a little way in there too, because if the if the DDA is going to continue helping maintain this, it could be a a real tribute to you know our ambassadors and our debt team are on the streets every day making downtown a better place for everybody to live in, and so that might be a nice way to you know that. commemorate. I love that. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for that. Great idea. Yeah. Yeah. It's really nice, and because you know he it's. I mean, a street naming is something, but every people drive down our streets that aren't from downtown, but anybody that uses that will have encountered an ambassador who's helped them out in some way or another um, yeah. in the past couple of years, so. <clears throat> That's a great idea. Um, All righty. Um, so, okay, so there are, there is at least one other comment that I know Yvonne needs to read. Um, <coughs> Um, before she does that, I just, uh, I just want to say thank you to everybody that has joined us. Um, I do want to suggest everybody get outside because I see, from what I can see, I think Spencer is the only other one from... <laughs> it is so all, beautiful, out. Oh my gosh, oh, this is yeah. amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't help myself. I had to sit outside. Um, it's uh -huh. a wonderful day. Um, and the, I, I know that at least one of the comments that um, is coming, Commissioner, is on the first item that we discussed that you had to step out. So yeah. if you need to step out, um, yeah. please, please so. Can I, Marta, can I make a quick comment before Commissioner Higgins yes, leaves course, about the, um, just want to um, update everyone on the seawall issue. Um, I know that uh, Colonel Dodd came and gave a presentation to, I think it was our committee, maybe it was the full board, I can't remember, but um, this item went to city commission um, last week, I think, for first reading. It was approved on first reading and there were some comments uh, from the commission that uh, they're working on. So um, it seems like it's moving forward, but um, you know, the city staff is, is trying to sort of address the comments that were brought up by the commission, which uh, revolved around uh, impact of this ordinance on private property owners and, and residential property owners specifically. One, one other item that's really important for the DDA is that, um, you know, back before I was on the board, the DDA engaged a planning firm uh, called Savino Miller to do a design plan for the Baywalk and also the shoreline. Uh, and, and the idea was for that to be incorporated into the city code in Miami 21 so that uh, act activities on the shoreline going forward would be required to comply with this new uh, design standard. Um, 
the way that this is proceeding right now at the city is is in somewhat of a bifurcated form. And so the ordinance that um, Colonel Dodd came and presented to us, which just deals essentially with the seawall heights, is proceeding. But the design package that is something that DDA is heavily invested in and I think wants to see through um, is, is, is not proceeding in that same path because it has to go to the PZAB. Um, and so I just want to make sure that we as a committee and certainly as the DDA board are, are aware of what's going on. And I've been tracking it and, and Neil is doing a great job as usual of, of, you know, keeping everyone informed. And, mm. um, but I just want to make sure that, uh, you know, the, 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 the committee and, and the board don't lose sight of this because it's an important, uh, initiative of the DDA. And certainly there's a lot of, um, sunk costs that the DDA has into this plan. And I, and I think it's a good plan and it just needs to get um, codified and into a place where um, people are working towards implementing it. Yeah, and just also on the seawall issue, once the city of Miami works through it, we're gonna have to make sure there's harmonization at the county level, even if the entire county doesn't want to do it on the Miami River, it makes no sense that the part that's unincorporated has a different seawall regulations from the part that is incorporated in the city of Miami. And so um, we have to do it in the sunshine, I think, Spencer, but maybe we could yeah. um, work through that. And then also, I think some of you remember, um, I started working this legislative session for the very first time to begin to get seawalls included in the PACE program so that private property owners would have a long-term easy financing mechanism if they wanted to repair or upgrade their seawalls. And um, I mean, I'm fully aware that when you, know, when you introduce a new idea in Tallahassee, it's a two to three year process. So I just did the legwork this year for year one, not expecting it to pass, and, but you know, talked to quite a few people about it and um, plan on, on doing that again next year. So we'll be, I'll be working with Chris on our, our legislative director to come up with our urging and, and then perhaps um, if, if that's something the DDA is interested in, um, it's, I mean, we don't have many, too many private property seawalls, but, uh, but we have some, um, you know, they could be supportive of it as well. Spencer, thank you so much for your comments. I did speak with Colonel Dodd a few weeks ago and asked him about that because the, the idea was to present both the seawall height ordinance and the updated waterfront design guidelines in tandem. Um, we do have to go through PZAB. Uh, Colonel Dodd was advised by city legal that the seawall height ordinance did not. And that's why they proceeded because city commission was, was already meeting. It was already mm -hmm. a placeholder on the agenda. Uh, so I had just reached out to city of Miami planning to find out when the next PZAB meeting is and to ensure that we are on that agenda. Great. Thank you. And, Thank you. And one last thing is um, the, the back bay study that we were, um, mm -hmm. w w th they made a presentation to us on, uh, I think the IPR, the interim project report is due uh, sometime in mid-May. So as soon as that comes out, I'll make sure everyone gets a copy. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Um, Thank you. Nice to see everyone. Yes, likewise. Thank you, Spencer. And on and on the item, particularly with the with the item um, on the design standards for for the Baywalk, um, we'll also make sure to work with uh, Commissioner Russell's office because this is also his item, um, his his district. So we'll make sure to circle back with him and inc include them in that conversation. Um, all right. Thank you for bringing that up. And I think Tad, you had a quick question um, that you wanted to bring up real quick. Yeah, I, I was actually just texting with Christina and um, and she answered it. Thanks for, um, and by the way, it's it's great to see everyone. Yeah, I, I just wanted to, to flag. I think that, you know, in regards to the pit stop program and, and, you know, everything that the DDA has been doing to get these toilets on the street, I know Christina and staff have been working very hard with the city to push this. Um, you know, look, I, I think it's very critical that we get these permanent toilets as soon as possible. Um, the homeless issue is only going to increase, especially with COVID. Um, you know, look, rent is due today. More and more people every month are losing their jobs and are gonna end up on the street. 
And if we think we have a homeless problem now, in six months, it's going to be probably a lot worse than it is today in downtown Miami and cities all across the country. So I, I think the DDA has been at the forefront in addressing this in a humane way. And, you know, if, this, if we're going to get these toilets in four to six weeks, which would be great, and I know that's what Christina has been pushing for, I want to do everything we can as a, as a board to, um, you know, to stress that in the public that, you know, we are, we are looking for solutions in a humane way that's giving the homeless an opportunity, um, you know, to use these restrooms and at the same time supporting our businesses and residents with, uh, with public toilets. So, you know, I know the city's doing their part too, but, uh, you know, as we've seen in the press, you know, not all these toilets are sanitary. I know ours are and we're, and we're staffing them. Um, and we're going to continue to do that. I just want to make sure that as a board, we're all aligned on the sense of urgency of, uh, of this. And I know Christina and Jennifer have been doing a great job in updating everyone, and we're working hand in hand with them. So I'm glad, I'm glad Jennifer brought it up. Good. Yes, and th thank you, Ted. All righty. Um, so I think we have one other comment, and that one will pertain to um, yeah, the, um, the, the park. Yeah, so just um, just to let you know, uh, I've been advised by our county attorneys that the item is that has been communicated enough to the county that I any quote unquote evidence that I would be hearing. So whether that's coming in through email or whether that is coming through conversations, I'm now in a quasi judicial manner, and so. I'm not able to hear those things except in a public forum where all parties involved are invited. Um, so I didn't realize this was going to come up because it wasn't on the agenda. So I will, um, I will get with the county attorney's office and see if, since this is a publicly noticed meeting, if that is okay. Uh, but for now, I personally can't listen or hear comments. And so I realize this is a crucial, you know, it's going to be a very robust and crucial conversation for the, um, the CBD and, and for, for Brickle and beyond. But everyone should be prepared that they are going to have to make their comments at the county zoning. I do not know when that is going to be. I don't know if it's soon or later, but for me, it would be great if the, I'll check with the county attorney's office to find out if I'm permitted, but since as of last week, I didn't ask this specific question, it made me nervous. I don't wanna do anything illegal. Um, so I, that's why I stepped out before, but I'll get clarity and I will let, uh, Christina know because what we could do is put that item on the agenda and then I could join whatever meeting it is later or before or however that is so I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings by not listening but I also just don't want to violate any laws so oh, yes. um, so if you guys are done and and you want to keep talking about that I'll, I'll hop off the meeting and we'll be very um, clean cut <laughs> yeah. so. um. No, and, and we appreciate that, um, Commissioner, and um, and thank you for the update as well. I do want to let everybody know that this this entire meeting has been recorded. Um, so if there is a need to review it at some other point, or if you're able to review it, um, Commissioner, at some other point, everything will be almost like as fresh as if you you could relive the entire yeah. experience over. Yeah, again. exactly. I'll 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 do some digging since it's a public meeting, but since it wasn't on the agenda. I yes, think, no, of course. It, yeah. Right, it, 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 right, right. No, it, it came up through public comment, and and um, as these meetings have progressed, um, we uh, we are we always take public comment, but we are now absolutely required to take public comment. Of course, comment. we have um, to. You know. So, and I just have to leave when people are publicly commenting on this. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's okay. about to happen. Um, so All right, we'll, adios, we'll everybody. You. Miss you. We'll you farewell. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I will share the screen. I think it'll be the best way and read it out loud. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay. Okay, so good morning. My name is Christina Lessie. I live at 801 Briggle Key Boulevard, apartment 1004, Miami 33131. My question is regarding Southside Park. When or where was there an invitation to a public hearing posted in regards to this site? Pre-coronavirus, I visited this park nearly three times per week and never saw 
a public hearing poster. I would have been there with over 200 parents, just like we did a few years ago. I was able to attend last month's and this morning's virtual urbanization meeting and listen to the DDA's concerns regarding the development of the fire station located in Brickell. I understand the board members' concerns that it is not technically within the boundaries of the DDA. However, to further emphasize your position, it does serve many of its residents. I wanted to share with you a conversation that includes County Commissioner Xavier Suarez, and at that time, City Commissioner Francis Suarez regarding that site back in 2017. This park has been used as has been used a political token site since the early 80s. Since the early 80s, Miami, I believe, first high school is located on this site. This site was always intended for the community's use, not for pri for private, which I will eventually happen here. This space would better be serve to our community, especially the residents who live in the immediate area in affordable housing should not be pushed further, further out, pushed out further west. Uh, west Brickle or Brickle does not need an additional luxury office, residential or another hotel. My greatest hope is that the county and the DDA will strongly oppose this site and help reserve this space for our community for all to enjoy, not just the elite of Brickle. Thank you for your time and listening to my concerns. Be below is a trail of emails regarding the fire station and Southside Park site. Thank you, Yvonne. Do you have any, do you have any, well, first, um, is, if, is, is anybody able to answer the specific question of um, the public hearing uh, notice for the site? And that, it, from, from our earlier conversations, I don't think that's the case, but I just want to open up if there is the ability to answer that question. Christina or Barnaby? Yeah, I was going to say Barnaby. Uh, I, I will advise from the city, the city of Miami's perspective, uh, the transaction was noticed a couple times. There was a previous, and when I say transaction, it's not a transaction, but the, um, the, the, the item most, you know, the item with the, the, the developer um, a couple times. There was originally uh, an agreement that was approved by the commission, the city commission perhaps three years ago or so, I'm going from memory, um, and that was at a publicly noticed meeting. Um, this item that we're now talking about came back to commission perhaps a month, two months ago at a publicly noticed meeting uh, because it was determined that the previous agreement um, was not entered into with a valid organization, and so we're, the, the city decided to enter into uh, the agreement with this current developer. Um, so both uh, meetings were at uh, publicly noticed meetings. Thank you, Barnaby. Yvonne, do you have any additional comments? No. Uh, okay. Let me just check if anything has come in right now. And, and just to clarify, since we spoke about this at the beginning of the meeting, we'll work with the developer and the city to make a presentation, um, you know, as soon as possible based on the timeline um, with the county as well. Um, like Commissioner Higgins mentioned, she didn't know the date of that meeting, but we'll share that with the committee and schedule that accordingly so that we have time to discuss this in that forum. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I think with that, we've come to the end of our agenda. Um, I do want to thank everybody from the public that has participated um, in all the various ways. I know that this is a little jarring and not without its technical difficulties, um, but, but absolutely thank you. Franklin, I see you signing off. Um, thank you for joining us. Have a wonderful weekend. Um, this might be the very last day that we have this wonderful weather. So um, please, please do as Spencer and I have done and get outside, enjoy the weekend and everybody stay safe and healthy. And hello, Chloe. <laughs> uh, hi, Chloe. Say hi. All right. Thank you. Uh, all righty. Thank hi, you, everyone. everyone. Thank you, Marta. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Bye. Have a great weekend. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone. Hi, Gary. <laughs> You're getting cookies at this time, bro. Yes. Thank you, Tina.